All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us for this month's installment of uh, Y charts, uh, kind of charts of the month, right? So I think we've we've uh, talked about a few different titles here. Um, you know, looking at five charts to share clients. Big surprise again this month. We do have more than five charts, um, but I think you know with the, uh, the the track record of the the quality, I think you'll all be excited to see what we've what we've got put together here. And um, it's all coming from from Charlie, who's joining us. Uh, again, for I think it's our third or fourth month in a row, right, Charlie? Yeah. How's it going, Caleb? Yeah, it's great. It's great. Always, always exciting to have you on. I think, I think this keeps getting better every month. At least, uh, you know, as I go through the charts, I get more and more excited about what you put together, and it's always a great chance to to look back at. Um, you know, I, I think what you told me the other day is that there is really no boring month or, or boring period of time. You know, in the markets recently, so it's it's hard to pick out just a few things, but it's always fun to look back and see which, uh, which trends really stuck out over the recent time period. So thanks for joining us. I guess anybody that, you know, if this is your first time joining a little bit about Charlie, Charlie's CEO and founder of compound capital advisors. Um, he's got a, a great blog out there, uh, called compound. So if you aren't already reading that, uh, routinely, you should definitely check that out as well as, uh, follow Charlie on Twitter. Right. So I'm um, always putting out good content, good thoughts, uh, at Charlie Boello. So Charlie, thanks again for joining us. And, uh, you know, if you don't have any objections, we'll jump right in. Yeah, let's do it. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, of course. All right. So we've got five trends to cover today. Uh, you know, here they are. First one is put these charts on your wall. Second one is expectations are everything. Not all risk is rewarded. Uh, really interesting uh, idea around how to win any argument over investments. And then lastly, uh, the buy the dip generation, how that came to be. So, so let's jump into the first one here. And, and this one, Charlie, when I first saw the title for this and first saw your blog, I, I kind of thought, you know, based on you know, how active you are in social media, you were talking about these are some great charts to, to post on your wall and kind of share with people in the social environment. But upon reading, I realized this is much more literal, right? You said, hey, cut these charts out, stick them on your wall and let these be a, a, a way to, to keep in your memory some things that have happened in the market and, and kind of humble you as you think about the market going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Hum humble the keyword there because in markets we learn if you've been around any period of time that there's no such thing as can't, there's no such thing as won't, there's no such thing as impossible. We've, we've pretty much seen it all in markets. So uh, I like to put some charts uh, as some reminders. Everyone ha will have their own unique charts probably to, to put up, but uh, these are just a few from the posts that I put up. Uh, that serve as as important reminders for us to keep us grounded and to show us that really nothing is impossible in markets. Yeah, so I think you had maybe 15 or 20 of these in your blog post, right? But I think we've got a few here to call out. So um, yeah. you know, if anybody wants to look at all of them, you know, definitely check out the blog. But let's touch on the ones that uh, you especially uh, kind of carved out here. Absolutely. So all-time highs, it's been a a, a big topic this year, of course, there's been over 50 all-time highs in the S&P 500 this year, but this is this is not a new thing for the S&P. If we go back to uh, 2013, the S&P hit its first all-time high since October 07. So it was a while back and you probably don't remember this or at the time people were worried. You know, they were talking about all-time highs as being perhaps a bearish indicator. They were saying things like double top, uh, a lot of different uh, negative connotations, but if if you if you looked at the data and you look at, just study the uh, the historical data points and and you just say what happens historically following an all time high and and really it's it, there's nothing exceedingly bearish and there's nothing exceedingly bullish the market just tends to rise over time as it normally does um, so you know what we've seen since March 2013 is we've seen 329 more all-time highs. And each one of these uh, kind of induces that fear. It's natural, right? Something is, you're supposed to buy low and sell high, we're told, right? So what could be higher than an all-time high? The difficulty is, of course, uh, when you're looking at a broad market, it's going to go up over time. And uh, certainly uh, you, you want to try to buy it lower, but uh, an all-time high by itself uh, is not a signal. Uh, it's not a sell signal, right? You need something other than that to tell you perhaps this is a time to take uh, some risk off. Uh, so uh, just a reminder that uh, all-time highs by, by themselves aren't telling you much other than they tend to be followed by more all-time highs. 
more highs after highs, right? So, so when this chart's on your wall and you're looking at this, Charlie, what's the, is this a, an inspirational chart that makes you think, hey, anytime's a good time to still get into the market? Or is it one that's more cautionary saying, you know, seeing this many all-time highs, you know, over the last 10 years or so um, makes you a little bit uh, leery to, to jump right in? Yeah, I mean, it, the context is important, right? So by itself, it, you know, perhaps it doesn't tell you much. You have to look at valuation. You have to t- look at other indicators that perhaps are in- indicative of higher risk. Um, certainly now, if we look at the all-time high since twenty, since twenty thirteen, this is more than even what we saw in the nineties, which is pretty incredible. So um, we we just passed that uh, early uh, early uh, this month, and and so. Uh, that's something to think about. Certainly stocks aren't cheap here. Um, but I think the more important principle, whether you're looking at uh, an index or looking at uh, an individual stock or security, um, there doesn't have to be, uh, the upside is not necessarily capped, right? Like 20 years from now, hopefully if we're optimistic and, uh, and human prosperity continues and there's economic growth and there's innovation, hopefully regardless of what happens between now and then, uh, this chart will be higher, right? And there'll be more all-time highs. There's no guarantee, of course, but uh, you know it, you have to have an optimistic outlook to be an investor. Absolutely, and and, and you have to kind of ignore <laughs> that that uh, all-time high thing as a signal, anyway. Hard, hard not to be optimistic after looking at that chart, but, but talk us through the next one here, looking at Moderna. Yeah, so this I have a lot of these charts that I looked at that I like to look at. There's a saying in markets where people like to say that it's priced in. You probably heard that, like the good news is priced in or the bad news is priced in. And there's this notion that you can, someone can tell just by looking at the price, saying, okay, that particular news is there. It's supposed to be an efficient market. Therefore, immediately investors investors will react to that. Uh, news or or that that fundamental change in the company, and it, it will go to the price that it should be. And time and again, we see that um, when there's really news that's exponential in nature, it's very difficult for investors to price that in immediately. I think Moderna is a great example of that. So, you know, last March they come out with their, um, you know, they start their phase one trials, the stocks at, at $26. It's, it's pretty promising back then. Uh, no one knows when it's going to be completed, of course, but you know, the stock, the stock is, is, is certainly not. And people are saying, well, at that point, there's some good news priced in. If you look at, at the chart leading up to that point, uh, but I think more interesting is in December, right, we have authorization. We know that the vaccine is safe and it's effective. Uh, and we know there's just going to be huge demand and people are trying to wrap their arms around, okay, well, how much demand, what are the revenues going to be from this? What are the, what are the profits going to be in future years? And the stock price is at $140. You're thinking, well, you know, surely that has to be anticipating a lot of good news. And then uh, you look what happened this year, right? Where it's where it's substantially higher from there. So just the lesson here is it's very difficult to know what's priced in at any given time. And if you if you think you know exactly what's priced into something, you're probably fooling yourself. Yeah, I remember you know in my my former role as a trader that the same we always used was buy the buy the rumor, sell the news, right? But it seems like yeah. Just, just buy everything. <laughs> if, if yeah, the, that's the, the, in this bull market. Rumor. It's been yeah, that's right. Buy the rumor and buy the news, perhaps on leverage or on margin. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes we, we've we've taken away this sell part. And this third chart here, it, it's it's we could substitute with any number of assets in in the past year. We've seen a lot of these parabolic advances, but Solana, the crypto. The crypto coin Solana has really captured the intention of, for, of a lot of people, just given what's gone on in the last few months. Uh, but the point of this chart is that no one rings a bell at, at the top or, or the bottom for that matter. There's no, uh, there's no ability to, to, if you think that something's a bubble, there's no ability to predict when that bubble is going to end, right? Everything looks like a bubble 
uh, early on when it's in its infancy, right? So if we looked at a stock of, of, of any early stage company and it's coming from nothing, it has, you know, Moderna was a good example. That looks like a bubble. Uh, Bitcoin at, at, at $10 looked like a bubble at $100 at $1,000. All of that looked like a, a bubble over time. Um, so it's it, it, it's it's very difficult uh, to to do anything with that uh, information. And I just would just caution uh, people at trying to, to pick uh, tops and 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 trying to just be dismissive of something and calling it a bubble. Um, because as you can see from this chart, uh, you know, the, once somebody thinks it's a bubble, it can, many more <laughs> people can jump aboard, right? Yeah. And what about that term in general, Charlie? I, I feel like there might be some fatigue kind of around that term where people just don't you know, respect the concept of a bubble. We hear it so much. You know, if I think back to, um, you know, the housing bubble, right? Like back in, in the earlier part of the, the century, you know, people yeah. heard about that bubble. It was, it was scary. Now, now every sure. time a, a price seems to take a big jump, it's a bubble, right? Correct. Yeah. And look, I mean, I think that's the, the classic uh, the textbook definition of a bubble would be an asset class that's so divorced from its fundamentals that it doesn't make sense that it's, it, it would be difficult for you to earn a return on that given the price you're paying for that. And so if we looked at dot-com stocks in March, 2000, that, you know, had no revenue and no prospect for revenue that were, that were, you know, trading at just ex extreme market caps, or we looked at, at housing, like you said, where it was so disconnected um, from people's incomes and the only ability to afford that asset was to put less money down or for them to give you a loan uh, where you lied about your income or any number of things. So, um, so certainly I think those are appropriate terms. The difficulty with things like crypto assets is, as you know, there's, there is no fundamental um, driver of it, right? So it's more a, of a belief. It's, it's more akin to uh, artwork or collectible in that sense that it's worth what the price um, someone's willing to pay for it. Uh, and that's very difficult to quantify. And, and certainly these are these charts are parabolic in nature and they're going to have huge corrections and swings over time. Um, but how could you possibly pinpoint where what is too much, right? So should Bitcoin trade at 40,000? Should it trade at 30,000? Should it trade at 100,000? Should it trade at a million? Should it trade at a thousand? We could debate that all day long. And, and where, where it becomes a, a bubble in the sense that you can't possibly uh, earn a return from that is very difficult to determine with these types of asset classes. So no, I don't, I don't think it's helpful, particularly in, in this. The, that's not to say bubbles don't exist. I, I, I definitely think they do. I just think, uh, as you said, we're, we're using that term much more frequently these days, anything that's kind of run up very quickly. And um, crypto is just a, a very different animal, right? Uh, yeah. In that sense. Indeed. Well, let's, let's jump into our next topic here. Yeah. And as we do, I will take care of a quick housekeeping item because a couple of people have already asked. Um, all of the charts that are featured in the presentation today have been added to uh, templates. So if you go into Y charts, go to our fundamental chart, and open up the um, templates section where you can start there. You can actually access um, all of these charts within a category there that, that outlines this webinar. But also, you know, we mentioned, you know, there are a lot of charts that we didn't get a chance to talk about on that, put on your wall, right? So those are on your blog at the compound too. But let's jump into the second trend here, which is, or the, yeah, exactly, uh, event to look at, which is expectations are everything. And this one starts out with a little bit of a, a hypothetical. Yeah. So if we, if, if I told you nothing else uh, about two companies, company A and company B, except the following, their revenue, their net income, what year they were founded, how many employees they have, um, you could see they're very different, right? You're talking about 66 billion in revenue versus 800 something million net income of 7 billion versus a, a net loss of 700 million. Um, company A is founded in 1912, company B 2012, and the number of employees in company A over 100,000 versus 2,500 for company B. And, and looking at that, knowing nothing else, Caleb, what, what would you think, which company would you say would have a higher market cap? I feel like you're setting me up here for a trap, but company A obviously <laughs> seems like the 
the clear favorite to be valued at a, at a higher price point. Yeah. And, and, and what we'll see in the next chart is that this isn't a hypothetical. There's, these are actually two companies and, and company A is Lockheed Martin, which actually has a lower market cap than company B, which is Snowflake, um, the, uh, the cloud uh, company. So um, expectations and markets are really everything. They're, they're driving uh, prices. They're, they're, they create a narrative for the markets based on those prices. And it's, it's, uh, it's those expectations as they change um, that, that really will, will drive the future uh, path of these companies. So, uh, but what you must, might be wondering is how, how is it possible that that one company could, could have such different fundamentals, right. than another and, and, and be valued uh, at a higher market cap. And, and it seems, it seems insane. But if we look at the next, the next uh, chart here, we have the snowflake trading at almost a hundred times sales uh, versus a little over one time sales for Lockheed Martin. So what, what's that, what, what is that telling us? It's telling us that investors are, are betting that snowflakes growth rate, which in their most recent quarter, they're growing at over a hundred percent um in, in the last 12 months in terms of revenues they're betting that is going to continue um, at that pace or, or at a similar pace for some period of time now the difficulty as we talked about last month with alibaba when you get expectations extremely high um even if the company does execute on that um it, it the question is also uh, what will investors in Snowflake, let's say five years ago from now, let's say five years from now, Snowflake grows at 80% a year. Let's just pick that crazy, which would be you know, an unbelievable number, right? Given, given its size at, at this point. Um, what will investors five years from now believe about the future growth? And if they don't think that that growth rate is sustainable, you're going to see that price to sales ratio come way down, right? And that's, so that's going to drive things. Um, so it's an ever evolving um, mechanism here where it's not static. So the expectations are here today, um, but they're going to change. The story will change. Maybe it'll get better. Maybe Snowflake will exceed those expectations, but um, they're so unbelievably high um, that the odds of, of uh, as an investor are stacked against you. Right. And, and Lockheed Martin, you know, it's trading a multiple below the market. Right? Maybe you'd consider that a value stock. Different people would have different opinions. Um, and we could point to a number of stocks like that. But the same question there. Is it more likely to exceed those expectations going forward? But it's just a remarkable thing to see. And you don't often see this type of, this type of disparity between two companies um, and expectations are driving all of that. Yeah, it's hard not to think about that chart from, from last month. And anybody that didn't join us last month, we had... Uh, I think it was still the price to sales ratio, but it was Alibaba versus Amazon, if I remember correctly, right? And you just see over yeah. time, those multiples eventually converged, right? So, um, you know, another way to look at this, you know, if you do some quick math on the information on the page before, you know, even if you say uh, a multiple of 10x sales is a little bit more uh, appropriate or, you know, what we might see as a, for a software company that's in a high growth phase, that means 10x their revenue is already built into the stock price. So, I know your point here is not to look at fundamentals or fundamentals don't tell the story when you're looking at these hyper growth companies, but um, how, do you, how do you build that in, right? If you're thinking about making an investment or even if you know this is a, an underlying holding in, in a, an ETF or a fund or something of that nature, is your, are you, you know, assuming that that 10X growth in their revenue is, is something that you're not going to benefit from if you invest in right now or that those expectations could still precede that? Yeah, I, th I think the, the the bigger point is this doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? When when Amazon came out, and, you know, during even during back in 90, 1997 and went public, you know, its market cap was nothing like Snowflake. It's just you know these these companies are just so much bigger today when when they come public and um, the euphoria or when Snowflake went went public. Um, last year was just enormous, and I wrote about that then. And and it's you could see the the price to sales ratios actually come down 
um, from from its peak. <laughs> so, uh, and and you know that's a function of of two things. One, its revenue has has indeed increased, and two, it's it's below its peak. So, uh, the way I look at it is is this is this is just a a sign of of investor sentiment today that it's still extremely high. And what's interesting about this year in markets and um, we're, you know, we don't have any slides in here to talk about this is, is you've seen a lot of readjustment in terms of that. Um, Snowflake is, I guess, more, one of more of the exceptions. So if, if we're talking about SPACs uh, where they were trading just at huge premiums and now they're at discounts, right? Uh, if we talk about uh, companies like Zoom or Peloton, and I can name 20 other companies like that that have been cut in half. Uh, that were trading at huge valuations. So a lot of the high growth names from last year have been uh, have are down 40, 50, 60 percent. Um, so it's 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 been an interesting thing to watch, but it hasn't taken down everything. And I guess Snowflake, it could be that good. Like the other thing is there there are companies uh, that. It is not impossible, right? For Snowflake, let's we don't know. It, sure. it could, okay, so it's it's a it, you know it's we think it's it's extremely valued, but could it be a trillion dollar company? Maybe it is the next uh, you know big four, right? Of the next generation, right? So in in that sense, um, you know that that is always possible, um, but that's not something that's going to happen next year, right? Or the year after. You're talking about. Um, executing year after year, right? For yeah. 10, 20 years. Um, so we'll see. So I, I just view it as, you know, just another reminder, you know, for looking at uh, investor sentiment that this, we are at, we are still, we still have some froth in the market uh, and, and just be cautious in general. But, you know, it doesn't, there's no, there's nothing to say that it can't, it's impossible for Snowflake to grow into it. It's just, it's so much harder at a hundred times sales to, uh, to, to have a profitable investment than if it was at 20 or 30 times. Right. Yeah. I think I really liked one of the quotes you had in the blog post along with this too, saying, you know, valuation multiples, I'm, I'm going to butcher the quote, but valuation multiples are some number today multiplied by the expectations for tomorrow. So, you know, this is a, a really good depiction of that, of that thought here. Yeah, that was that was from Morgan Housel, who's a who's a great writer, and 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 yeah, the point there is that um, the story is forever changing. That story about tomorrow, and as it does, the valuations will change. Right? So there's no given that Snowflake won't have competitors that come in. They already have they already have many, but there's no given that competitors won't come in if it's such a great business and start taking share or their margins will be compressed. Any number of things. There's always risk, right? So that story is going to change. And it and it could change for the better also. So um, it's it's just a function of markets that just be aware that um, expectations are everything, but it's really difficult to predict future expectations, which is, which is what really matter. And that actually leads nicely into the next topic, you know, talking about how not all risk is rewarded, right? I guess you mm -hmm. could look at investing in a company at such a, uh, you know, huge valuation as a risk, but, um, you know, talk us through this one. I, I know we, we, we've got a little ways to get to that point, but but start here with this chart for us. Absolutely. So we have here two things. If let's go back to May, 2006, so over 15 years ago, uh, there was really two big trends uh, in markets. Uh, and the first one was really the commodities trend. Um, it, 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 there was, uh, the commodities started outperforming really in 2002, 2003, and gold was really a favorite among investors during those years. And as you can see, during that five-year period, uh, going, heading into May 2006, Gold is up 155%, just huge, huge returns. And part of that was during a period where equity, equities were going down, which was in 2001 and 2002. And uh, we had a second trend here uh, in the next chart, which was also uh, an interesting thing in, in May 2006 was, of course, the housing market going crazy. Uh, and this is a chart of the Case-Shiller 20 city index. Uh, so over five-year period, it's up 77%. Uh, and everybody is in love with the housing market 
um, nobody believes that um, it, it could stop. Uh, and so naturally what Wall Street does best when you have asset classes doing well, they look to capitalize on that by coming out with new products. Um, so two, two new products were born in, in May 2006. One was the gold miners ETF, the GDX, and another was the U.S. home construction ETF, uh, which is the ticker was, was ITB. Uh, and there's this notion in markets, and you probably heard it, Caleb, everyone on the call has heard it, uh, more risks, more reward. It's the one of the fundamental tenets in finance is that higher, re, higher risk should be rewarded. If we look at the CAPM, um, capital asset pricing model, it's the, it's, it's the basis of that is if you take more risk, uh, if you hire the beta, uh, the, you should be rewarded with a higher expected return. Uh, and if we look at um, what's transpired since 2006, if we're comparing on the left side here, we have a chart a, of drawdowns uh, in the S&P 500, which is the light blue, uh, the darker blue, which is the home construction ETF, uh, and in the red, the gold miners ETF. You can see uh, significantly lower drawdown in the S&P 500, uh, even during the financial crisis there. Uh, you had 80% drawdowns in, in both the gold miners ETF and the home construction ETF. And if we're looking at just volatility, price volatility on, on the right chart there, we see the volatility of the gold miners and, and home construction ETF are more than double that of the S&P. So knowing nothing else, and if we're just theoretical here, we're in our ivory towers and we're, we're trying to figure out uh, which thing theoretically, in, if we're looking at this 15 year period, you took so much more risk in gold miners and home construction, you would say, well, you would have had to be rewarded for that um, in that 15 year period. Uh, and on the next chart, what, what actually happened is, of course, the opposite, where gold miners were actually down over that period home construction stocks were, were down until just recently uh, during the, the, the recent housing boom. Uh, but both of them uh, underperformed the S&P by just a huge margin. Um, so I think it's, it, it's an important concept that there's no, there's no law, there's no guarantee, there's no promise that just because you take a lot of risk, you're going to be rewarded for it. Uh, and the most extreme example this is one example we see where sectors, right, which are uh, a lot of sectors are riskier, you know, than than buying a broad index. Uh, but I think the most extreme example would be an individual stock that's on its way to zero, whether it's uh, Lehman Brothers or WorldCom and, and Enron, um, J.C. Penney, uh, and any of these companies right before they go bankrupt are at their maximum risk risk uh, and. Uh, buying it at that point doesn't certainly doesn't guarantee you uh, any reward. Um, so not to say that you're throwing the whole theory out because there's certainly a lot of truth to that. There's more risk in stocks than in bonds and more risk in bonds than in cash. And over a long period of times, you would expect it to be, uh, be expected to be compensated for that. Uh, but we've seen many times where that, that isn't the case. It actually leads to a, a kind of inter interesting concept, right? You mentioned the capital asset pricing model and how the beta of a security is going to indicate, you know, what your expected return is going to be over over a long period of time, especially compared to the market. But it, at least for you, Charlie, when you're looking at metrics like that, what's a realistic amount of history to look at, or you know, over what you know period of time, um, you know, would you consider, uh, you know, like like a five year look back or something like that, or, or is that too long term to understand these short terms in the market? No, I, I don't. I don't think. I think you go as far back as you can to get to give you as much context as possible, and and to see that things change over time as well, and the risk of something um, is not static, uh, whether it's an index or a sector. Uh, so it, it's it's only instructive up to a point, of course, history, right? So I, I think that you have to look at this as uh, as more of a, uh, more of an expectation thing uh, that there's no, there's no way that you could just plug in inputs. It's, this is in physics. We're not plugging in 
we're not doing equations for thermodynamics or something like that. There's, there's nothing you could plug in uh, to tell you um, the future risk and return of an asset, even if you have the past, right? I think the best example of that today would be the bond market, right? The historical average return and the bond market in the US, we have data going back to the mid 1970s, is seven and a half percent per year. Uh, so if you were just looking at going back, looking at that history and, and, and saying, all right, that's what I should expect as a bond investor going forward, you're going to be you know, very disappointed here because the yield on the average bond, uh, US bond and the aggregate index today is around 1.2%. Uh, so it's going to be impossible to get anywhere near that 7% uh, going forward. So uh, so, you know, history is helpful, <laughs> but you have to also look at the reality today uh, of what's sure. going on. And history, I guess, ties into our, our next um, topic here too, right? So always intriguing yeah. to learn how to win arguments, right? We, we all like to be able to come out on top when we're challenging anybody on their investment thesis. But uh, talk to yeah. us about this strategy, how to win any argument. <laughs> yeah, this is a game that... that people like to play uh, in social media or uh, a lot where they have a favorite investor investment of theirs and they, they try to say that it's better than you know, some other investment they're arguing about with someone else. And, and they'll point to a chart uh, inevitably that shows that their asset class or security of choice has just trounced the other one, right? And <laughs> what you usually see with these is an incomplete history right they'll um they'll 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 change the start and the end date to win the argument right which is how you win the argument um but of course you know anybody who's <laughs> who's looking at that will, will hopefully uh say well i know what you did there that's uh, maybe that's not the full story so i think two of the best asset classes um where this this game constantly goes on because you have just very strong opinions on both sides. You have the people who uh, love gold and think you can't do any wrong. And you have the people who love stocks and, and think that, that stocks uh, are always the best. And, uh, and so you'll see these, uh, you know, various different charts, but I just picked out two here over two different 10 year periods. So if you're a gold investor, a lot of people will, will, will put this out and to show you why gold is superior to stocks. They, you know, from September 2001 to September 2011, gold is up almost 600%. The S&P is almost flat over that period um, with, with two huge drawdowns. And if you saw nothing else, you'd say, yeah, gosh, gold is, is the best investment, hands down. You can't argue with that. And then uh, the stock person will come back with the next chart and say, wait, wait a second. Um, what about the last 10 years, which we've seen? Uh, the opposite, where the S and P's up 368 percent, and gold is down over the last 10 years, uh, and this will go on back and forth, and and people will argue uh, different points, and they'll do it with any number of securities, and you could do it with anything, and the time frame could be days, right? It could be weeks, whatever proves the point, right? Uh, that they're trying to win, which is is silly in and of itself, right? Uh, um, being right about what's better or worse in the past, or, you know, it doesn't necessarily tell you about the future. And there's an old saying uh, in markets, being right or making money, right? Which is two different things as well. Um, um, so you can be right about winning with this argument. And that's very different than, than making money and in investing uh, going forward. Um, but I think the last chart here is the most important uh, for people to understand that every asset class, I don't care what it is, stocks, bonds, gold, commodities, currencies, they all have cycles they, and cycles can last long periods of time. As we see here, we have gold in 1972, we're coming off the gold standard and it just goes on this phenomenal run, uh, you know, trouncing stocks uh, from 1972 to 1980 and then 1980, uh, gold could do it no wrong. You had just high inflation. You had uh, stagflation. You had a recession um, in 1980, and then another one in 1981 that lasted until 1982. Uh, so it seemed like gold was going to be the winner. And then, of course, things just started to turn around 
And for the next uh, 80s and 90s, pretty much stocks just dominated, right? Culminating in the dot-com bubble where stocks can do no wrong. And then over the last the 10 year period following that gold trounces stocks. And then in the last 10 stocks outperform gold. So if we're looking at the full period here, if we're being just looking at, let's say since 1972, yes, yeah, stocks have been the better investment. They've, they've had a higher return with lower volatility than gold, right? There's no debating that, but you know, being, if, if you're saying that stocks are always the best investment, we, we can see that that's not true. Uh, and there's been long periods of time where stocks uh, uh, have done nothing, right? So I think for a lot of investors, the lesson here is that diversification will help you uh, kind of stick with the overall portfolio because it's going to balance out those asset classes, which are sometimes working and sometimes uh, not working. So perhaps the gold bugs and the equity bulls, perhaps the best solution actually would be for them to get together and say, what percentage do we put in each? <laughs> and now we, don't, we can stop arguing over, over what's the best. Right. I, I think one of the things that and you just mentioned, it, but really jumped out to me when I read your post too. Um, you know, we think of gold as this store of value, right? In this kind of long-term um, you know, buy and hold asset class, but the volatility is, is actually higher than stocks over this time period. And I even looked mm -hmm. at a chart, you, you kind of got me interested. I looked at a chart for the max drawdown over the same time period of these two asset classes. And I don't know if, if you know the, the data, if you've looked at it the same way, but I, I think gold's uh, you know, max drawdown at one point was down 70%, right? So mm -hmm. certainly a, uh, an asset class that can, they can lose a lot of value over, over uh, you know, shorter time periods too. And, and long periods, right? I think the period from to go from 1980 to 2000, if you bought gold in 1980 and then you, you didn't look at it and you came back in 2000, 20 years later, it's down 50% over that period of time. So that's enough to tell you, A, it's not a anywhere near a perfect hedge against inflation because of course there was plenty of inflation yeah. prices rising over that period. And two, well, who's going to stick with something for 20 years that's cut in half, right? Not, not maybe if you had a gold bar buried somewhere, it's still there, but, um, you know, more realistically, you probably bailed out on, on that. So that's a long period of time as is U S stocks being down from 2000 to 2010, right? 10 years as an eternity. We don't nowadays, if we went 10 months, um, with stocks, without stocks being higher, people would probably lose their minds. Um, which I think we'll talk about, uh, in the next one. Here we go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. People buy the dip, right? <laughs> buy the dip. So, you know, if you're on this uh, call and you're, uh, I don't know what it would be, a, a Gen Z probably, or, you know, crossover between Gen Z and millennials, certainly Gen Z investors, um, they're, they haven't known anything else uh, uh, than buy the dip, right? And um, this is just a history of, of how, it, how it kind of it came to be. So, um, it didn't come out of, of nowhere. Uh, investors are, they're kind of rational beings where uh, sentiment and psychology are very important. And I think in markets, we see this thing uh, known as a feedback loop where you take an action, let's say you buy uh, stocks when they're down and, uh, and then you see the result. And if the result is prices go up, back up to new highs in short order, you're going to continue to do that, right? Until you're punished <laughs> from doing that. So uh, that really started in 2009. So coming off the low in March, 2009, we had our first uh, buy the dip, the first BTD uh, there in May. It was, it was a very small dip, 5%. And then, you know, uh, some people at the time, believe it or not, were saying, well, this, maybe this is it. We're going back down. There's going to be a retest. Uh, you know, we've, we've gone up so much and, and it, it was a big rally off the March lows, uh, but pretty short order, you didn't hit new highs. There was another correction, but again, short order back to new highs. So this kind of start set the table for what we would see since then, uh, over the next 12 years, which is the dips varied in size, but, uh, by and large, uh, you know, within a, a short period of time, uh, the stock market generally rallied right back to new highs. So I think we have a few other examples here of, of this tendency, a few of my favorite. Uh, 
So I'd say that my next favorite was in uh, 2018. And this was unique at the time because um, it was, it was a, a very fast move down. It was the fastest 20% decline we'd, we'd ever seen in the S and P up to that point uh, in time. And uh, if you went back and I did at the time and, and you looked at other 20% declines, um, we had never seen something that pretty much rallied straight back to new highs. So of course that's exactly <laughs> what happened there. Uh, there's a, there's a saying in markets people are probably uh, familiar with, which is uh, uh, stairs up, elevator down, right? Which is the notion that market trend tends to go up slowly and then uh, uh, down quickly. And uh, here we did have the down quickly, but we had the up even quicker. So, you know, throw throw that notion out along with everything else. But this, you know, really uh, reinforced people. Uh, that even a large decline could be bought and you'd be back at new highs. And then, of course, the ultimate, the ultimate test of buy the dip came last year. And we have this 35% decline, biggest since uh, the, the 2008-2009 uh, declines. And there was every reason in the world to believe at the time that it was going to last for a long time, be deeper than 35%. Um, we're shutting down the entire economy. Um, this is going to be the deepest recession we've had in a long time was the thinking and any, any number of things. Um, but of course we see this same trend, uh, you know, where the market by, I think August of, of that year. Uh, so we see a low in, in late March and by August we're, we're already pushing new highs. Uh, so really incredible, a, a testament to the buy the dip generation. And of course, from there, it didn't stop. It, it's continued from there. Um, so, and, and again, that, that ties in with that first all time high thing, right? So we, we came back, we hit an all time high, uh, probably would have been feeling pretty good if you didn't sell anything that you finally recovered everything and well, oh, maybe now I should sell something. Um, but of course the market continues to rally another over another thousand points and change on the S and P. Um, so on the, on the next table, so this is. So right now, where are we today? A little bit current market action. Uh, where we are today is we're in the midst of the 25th correction for the S&P that's greater than 5% since that March 2009 low. And so everyone's asking the, the question, well, why, why is it going down now? And so I put together this table, which um, it's kind of a, a joke essentially, cause there's always a reason and we don't really know the reason, but we, as human beings, we want to ha have a reason. We don't like the idea that stocks could, could just go down, um, because you know, there's selling pressure and people, whatever their, their sentiment, their people are, are negative. So we like to ascribe reasons. So here, you know, over through the years, we've had every reason in the world from, uh, yield curves to rising rates to inflation to European debt crises and uh, this time around, you know, I, I, I look up. Okay, well, <laughs> why are stocks going down? And you know, some people are blaming it on China with the property company. Uh, we have the Fed tapering, um, which seems to be on a lot of people's minds. We had the Delta variant, of course, which now seems to be subsiding, but. Uh, people are still using that uh, as a potential reason. And, and the question, of course, is, well, is it going to be like the last 24 uh, where, OK, you know, maybe this isn't a low, maybe it's going to go down some more, but irrespective, we're going to see new highs you know, in short order after that. Or is it going to be something different? And new investors would say, well, what could be different? This is this is how it's always been. Right. Uh, there's no. Um, was, was there a market before by the dip? Uh, and to those investors, I just said in this chart, I'd say, yeah, <laughs> wasn't that, it was just the generation before you that actually <laughs> lived through, uh, two dips that really took a long time to, to recover from. So the first one started in March, 2000, S and P gets cut in half, NASDAQ down over 80%. Uh, so it took seven year, over seven years for the S&P to get back to new highs. And it just did it very briefly there in 2007, only to be smacked you know, down with the, an even bear, bigger bear market in, in the financial crisis. And you know, that took six, six years uh, to get back to new highs. Uh, and then 
you know, of course, uh, you know, here we are today uh, at much higher levels. So uh, yes, they're, they're every dip uh, <laughs> doesn't have to be bought. Um, we've seen that we don't know when it, 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 look, this could go on for year, many more years, but um, uh, it's just good to be mindful that uh, there, there are all different types of markets uh, in history and um, don't get too confident <laughs> in thinking that, uh, there won't be any bell that's wrong to say this dip is different. Uh, I don't think anyone would think like the high that we just saw in early September could possibly be worse than what we saw before the pandemic, right? Last year in terms of recovering, right? It would be hard. So I think people are certainly been, and rightfully so conditioned to believe this is just going to be yet another dip. And most of the time they'll be right, right? Because the tendency is is for, is for stocks to go up over time, but there will be a period and we don't know when, or there'll be a more difficult period. It doesn't have to be seven years or six years, but perhaps it could be, it could be a few years uh, before, guess, quick, before quick stocks. question for you on yeah. that, Charlie, right? So you mentioned being conditioned, right? And you know, when I look at this chart, it, it resonates. I actually got into the industry in 2008, right before that, uh, you know, that huge sell off there, that 58% dip. And you know, talking to, you know, a lot of clients that I had back in the time or other people in the industry, you know, nobody was excited about that dip, right? Nobody was saying, hey, this is our chance to get in and um, kind of really take advantage of, of buying opportunities in the market. Whereas, right. you know, in the last 10 years, that's what everybody's saying. But, you know, how, how much of this also has been taught by the fact that, you know, when you went back to that period in 2008, or even, you know, earlier in 2000, I don't think there was this expectation that the Fed or or policy was going to ensure that the stock market kept moving in a direction upwards. Whereas I feel like maybe mm -hmm. that precedent kind of got established after the financial crisis, where now every time we do see a significant market event, um, I, I think there's some investors that believe that you know policy will be made that will keep that yeah. stock market moving in the right direction. How much of that do you think is yeah. trained and, and created that conditioning? Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to it's hard to say. This is just speculation. Uh, it's hard to say what's driving that sentiment. I, I think faith in in the Fed and faith in, let's say, the fiscal is, is certainly all else equal. It's helpful in, in terms of limiting limiting the damage. Certainly was helpful last year, right? If you if you're throwing um, five trillion in, in new debt uh, and um, the Fed is is adding a few trillion to their balance sheet. Um, that that well, we've saw what could happen from that, and the investor confidence. And if you if you hand out money to the American consumer, they're going to spend it. Uh, so so we learned that. I guess the the question would be: Are they going to? How confident are investors that they're going to continue to do that? If if um, if there's simply a decline that's not a pandemic, really, you know, is are they going to throw everything at just a? Uh, a market decline or a normal, let's say, I don't know, let's say normal recession or normal slowdown. Is that going to be the template for the future? Um, and I would also tell people that, uh, you know, there's that saying, don't fight the Fed. Um, but if we look at, at history, uh, if we look at the, these two big major declines on the screen, um, ask yourself what the Fed was doing the entire time down. So the Fed starts cutting rates in, in 2001. That didn't stop uh, the market from going down. They cut all or all rates all the way down to one percent um, um, by uh, by early two thousand three, uh, and then they left them there for a year. And a lot of people consider that perhaps one of the proximate causes of the housing bubble, um, leaving leaving rates low. But the point there is that it didn't it didn't stop once the market was ready to to reprice. It still repriced in spite of the Fed cutting pretty much every meeting for a couple of years. And then, of course, in the financial crisis, maybe we could, you could argue they didn't do it as quickly uh, as last year, but they they were again. The Fed cut rates. Actually, the first rate cut was in September of two thousand seven, it was a month before the S and P peaked, uh, and then they continued to cut rates. Of course, all the way down to zero by December two thousand eight, and the market bottomed in March two thousand nine. But um, they were throwing a lot of things at the market uh, back then, and. And so it's easy to say, okay, uh, the well, if the Fed's doing this, the market can't go down, but they were doing it, right? So, uh, and even last year, the market still went down 35%, even though the Fed had cut rates to zero almost immediately. 
uh, the fastest we've ever seen them just boom, they cut rates to zero and started back QE. Right. And ultimately, you know, it did, it did bottom, but there were, there were some scary moments in, in that month where stocks were, you know, had some of the largest down days in history in spite of the fed, you know, saying we're coming, we're going to do it. Right. And, and so, yeah, ultimately it did recover and probably most certainly recovered quicker. But uh, I think the notion that uh, they can prevent all future declines, well, we've seen it in the chart there prior to this. Uh, there's been declines, right, with an easy Fed pretty much for most of this period. So um, I guess your question more is, uh, you know, will we ever see, and it's a good question, will we ever see a long bear market again? Uh, without the Fed doing something, and and so let's say the top. Let's let's go hypothetical here. Have some fun. Let's say the top was in early September. Stocks keep going down. Things in China keep getting worse. Whatever reason, uh, you know, there's a, sl- a slowdown. The Delta in the winter gets worse, uh, and all of these factors cause stocks go down twenty percent. Do you think the Fed is going to continue with their taper? No, right? Do you think they're going to talk about yeah, raising rates next year? <laughs> Rate, rates that rate rise, they're pushed back, right? So, but it's an interesting question because they're already at almost maximum stimulus here, and then stocks will have gone down. Then what do they do? Then do they, do they start talking about negative interest rates? Do they start to, talking about buying equities like Japan has said? So there's, you know, the Fed can always do more, right? Um, but I think uh, it's not a good, probably not a good reason to be invested to think like uh, the Fed not a good insurance help. Call. <laughs> bail you out at any point in time, right? <laughs> because uh, we've seen it. We've seen these two just put this chart up and, and map out um, the what the Fed was doing all the way down to show you that they once once it gets in motion, it's hard it's hard kind of to stop that 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 psychology. All right. Well, we uh, I'm sure we could talk about that all day. We're we're coming up on the on the yeah. top of the hour here, so I, I do have a couple questions here. Uh, you know that have come through. Um, the first one is just thinking about, you know, we talked about gold and the, and the, the stock market, right? But I guess when you think about those two asset classes and their relationship between one another, how do you also consider, uh, you know, yields at any given time, you know, treasury yields and what's happening in the interest rate market to, to impact those two asset classes? Yeah. So what's it, yeah, what's interesting about both the S&P and gold, well, first of all, they're, you know, in relation to each other, there's zero correlation. So that's interesting in and of itself. So there's there's no tendency for stocks to go up and gold down and vice versa. So they can go up together, they can go down together, they can move in opposite directions. So they're really the the drivers of them are are completely different. They're not connected in any, any way, shape, or form. And that's different. Gold is different in that sense than other commodities like crude oil or things that are more tied to the business cycle. You do see some. You know, some more of a tendency to move together, at least in the down swings in markets, right? So, if you see, like we saw last year during the COVID collapse, you know, crude oil gets crushed, and you know, gold is is actually holding up uh, much better, right? Um, but in terms of interest rates, it's it's a weird animal. So, let's start with equities. There's no correlation between stocks and bonds historically. It's close to zero. Um, that doesn't mean again that. They can't go up together. The tendency is they do over long periods of time. Both stocks and bonds go up. But if we're looking at any given day, there's no predictability in terms of one going up or one going down. What we do find is when stocks go down hard in a particular day, bonds tend to be up uh, more, more often than, than other days because there's a flight to safety and, and yields are, are, tend to be falling on fears. Um, so, but I think your question is, and it's an important one, how do changes in interest rates affect both asset classes? And there's a perception, and it's, uh, let's start with stocks. There's a perception with stocks that rising interest rates are bad for stocks and falling interest rates are good. And it's very easy to disprove that. We just test it historically, and there's absolutely no correlation, right? It's actually the opposite is, is the case. If you look at the last hundred years, stocks have done better in rising rates and rising rate environments than falling rate environments. And you pr- can probably guess why, because more often than not, when rates are rising, the economy is doing better and that should be better than stocks. And, and, and the worst period for stocks are during deflationary collapses when interest rates are falling, right? And, and, 
Uh, you know, so, but overall, if we look at the period, the, the long periods of time, they're not correlated whatsoever. Stocks have, if, if we look at average returns on stocks uh, during down interest rate environments, uh, they're still positive and the same is true for all. So stock, but more so when interest rates are rising. Now, gold is, is, is um, similar to stocks in that there's no correlation between gold and, and yields, but there is an inverse correlation between real yields and gold. Um, so when it, real yields are rising, uh, gold tends to have its worst performance and it's, it's pretty dramatic on average. So the worst environment for gold is where um, you know, yields are rising more than the rate of inflation. And, and the theory behind that is just, okay, now we have a competing investment, right? Uh, for gold and there's a cost of capital, right? When, um, when bonds are giving you nothing, right? In term relative to inflation, uh, you'd probably be more likely to buy gold all else equal than if bonds are, are paying you, uh, compensating you above the rate of inflation, or at least rising towards that now. Um, so, you know, that's what we saw early this year is real yields were rising. You know, that's just fine for equities, right? That's, that's the economy is doing good, but that really hit gold hard. Um, you know, those rising real yields and gold's, you know, had a difficult year, year overall, um, now we're seeing real yields start to rise again. So we'll see what happens with gold. Um, so long-winded answer, but there's, there's, you know, we ha you have to be very careful about making generalizations between uh, interest rates and stocks and even gold because tendencies are not anywhere near absolute when it comes to this stuff. And I know a lot of people, and I've, I've written a post a lot of, about this, kind of dispelling this notion. A lot of people say that, uh, low interest rates justify high equity valuations, and that low interest rates are the reason for it, and 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 any number of things along those lines. But if you test the data, it's it's pretty weak uh, in terms of making that argument. You see, you actually see the highest valuations back in in 2000. Interest rates were actually above the historical average, so it it, it doesn't hold a lot of water if you actually test the data. Uh, on on interest rates, and even if you did believe that to be true, let's say you thought equity should be highly valued today because interest rates are so low, well, that's fine for what has happened. But what about going forward? Then what happens to equities if interest rates rise? Right <laughs> now, you have a problem on your hands if you if you believe that narrative. Indeed, and I, I guess you know if we learned anything today, it's that if we choose the right period of time in history, we can probably prove any one of those theories right. But if, if yeah, we uh, no question. One, easily, yeah. easily just, just prove well. <laughs> All right. So yeah, before right. we wrap up, um, have yeah. had a had a few questions, and I know these are always tough to answer, but kind of looking yeah. forward, right? So thinking about the next ten years, um, you know, a couple things that we talked about got people thinking. You know, one was you know when you think about that uh, chart that you had of, of gold and the S and P five hundred. Um, you know, is is your thought that that's going to continue to trend in the direction that it has been the last ten years, or do you expect to see a bit of a reversal there? And then also some questions around um, you know, the housing market and and that uh, price action over the next ten years, and even uh, just the money supply, like the M two supply, right? Since there's just so much money floating around, uh, you know, what, what's your what's your ten year yeah. on, on those things? <laughs> All right, let's let's start with uh, let's start with housing. Uh, I don't think what's going on today is sustainable. Uh, I think 20, 20%, the Schiller data came out yesterday and I tweeted about it. That's the, the highest rate of increase, close to 20% over the last year. It's highest rate of increase nationally we've ever seen. So in one year period. Um, so that's just a ridiculous, ridiculously high number, not sustainable. Um, if we look at, at new home prices relative to incomes, they're actually higher today than they were in, in 2005, 2006. So peak, so very stretched in terms of fundamentals. And I know people will argue, well, mortgage rates are much lower today and therefore it'll justify that. But again, that has to, you have to assume then that they're going to stay low forever. Uh, so there's a, there's a number of reasons to suggest that uh, the housing price increases are at least at this rate are definitely not sustainable. If they were, we'd have a real big problem on our hands, um, you know, similar to that. We may already be at that point, similar to the last housing bubble. And I think uh, the Fed continuing to do what they're doing in terms of, of uh, buying mortgage bonds, given where the housing market is, is just 
uh, indefensible. There's no, there's no reason for it. Uh, and, and I, I can't for the life of me understand why they, why they're doing it and why no one asked, uh, chairman Powell, that question, <laughs> what are you doing? Look at, look at the housing market. Look how, how strong these gains are all across the country. Why are you throwing fuel on that fire? Didn't you see what happened the last time, uh, the fed did this in terms of, of, of keeping rates low, too low for too long. And, et cetera. So, uh, so that's the housing market. Uh, my, my view, uh, I don't, it could continue to run, but it's not sustainable in terms of the, the price increases. People will get priced out. They already should be in terms of new homes at least. And, um, it, you know, that'll rectify itself one way or another, either through new home supply. Uh, it, it's just, it's, it's not likely to be sustainable, you know, unless, right. Unless there's always an, unless, unless mortgage rates, go back down if they go to two percent or one percent right so it's not it's not impossible we've seen these that in europe and if we look at european if we look at housing prices in the uk or australia or even canada people will tell you that the u.s housing market looks tame uh by comparison so that's not something we should aspire to uh, i don't believe but uh it's the point is it could always get uh, always get crazier i just don't think that should that should be our goal or national policy i don't think you want to create uh, property tax un, unaffordable well yeah everything like it's good for the seller i guess who's downsizing but everyone else it's not good for if you're staying in your home it means higher taxes it means higher insurance rates um if you're a new home buyer it's pricing you out or forcing you to stretch uh right it's it's causing generational issues or people family formation like they push that off because of that so there's a lot of deleterious effects of if you if you're going to try to prop up the housing market above its natural level and that's why i argue that the fed should have stopped buying bonds mortgage bonds a, a long time ago and they they probably should have started raising interest interest rates but uh that said they, they do they're going to do what they have, <laughs> what they have to do where they feel they have to do uh so what, what was the other thing now gold in the s p uh yeah, gold i have no I, I have no idea, right? Uh, if we learn nothing uh, on this, you know, who knows? Like uh, an equity, uh, a, an equity uh, bear or gold uh, bug would tell you, well, the last time equities were this highly valued were the late 1990s, and gold had a very strong run of outperformance following that. So that would be your, you know, that would be your base case. And then if you're an equity bull, you would say, well, no, this it's different. Uh, gold is obsolete. Right, it's been replaced. Uh, certainly, if you're a proponent of crypto, you would say it's been replaced by crypto. Um, if you think that interest rates are going to go much higher in the coming years, you'd say that's going to put pressure on gold. Um, so, who knows? Yeah, I think you know the 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 best answer if if you if you can if you can uh, figure out the right percentages of both, and and because of gold's volatility, most people can't stomach a, a large position in there. Uh, but if you, if, if you look at, you know, having a small position in gold, in addition to your diversified portfolio, you do see some benefits sometime, but you, in terms of lowering your overall volatility and drawdown, because it's not correlated. Right. Um, so I think that's a better answer, but, um, but all else equal gold tends to do better than stocks after at, when stocks are higher, highly valued. Right. Um, so that that's been the historical press in the past. Doesn't mean it'll happen uh, here going forward. Uh, and there was one more. What was what was the other one? Yeah, last one was just around money supply. Right. So it's money just supply. A lot yeah. of <laughs> 40% increase in M2 over the last two years. We've never seen anything close to that. Uh, no, that's not sustainable. Um, it's uh, if it is, we're we have we have big problems on our hand. We're, we're already going to have. Uh, difficulties um, in terms of the deficits uh, and the debt coming up, but um, uh, but who knows if we add if we're looking to add another three trillion to that, um, it's going to have to be monetized somehow. I mean, I guess they're saying part of it might be paid for. Um, we'll, let's wait to see what the details of, of that are. But um, but last year was just an outlier year in terms of the money supply, and this year it's to my shock it, it hasn't it's slowed down but not as much as one would think given we're they're talking about six percent gdp growth this year and you know why why is why is the money supply still still increasing the way the way it has been so um no that that 
that will have to be dealt with one way or another. Either the market will deal with it or, you know, or the Fed and, and, you know, the powers that be will recognize that this is, this is, this is causing other risk factors. Right. And it all ties into the bigger narrative, which amazingly we didn't talk about today, but the inflation narrative, which is proving, you know, as, as we talked about to, to not be so trans transitory. So ultimately I think what ends that extreme easy money and, and the sense that it doesn't matter, deficits and debt don't matter. It only, it only, that only gets pushed back when people start feeling that inflation and viewing it as a negative. And I think just now, just talking to people and listening um, to people talk about it, not bringing it up to there. I think, people are starting to recognize that maybe just maybe this is, this is something that's problematic now. Uh, you know, will, will they do something about it? I don't know, but at least I think that the narrative might be changed We're at the point where it's people are realizing it's not so transitory. These things are not going down. Crude oil is hitting now, you know, new cycle highs and, uh, and, uh, gas prices, uh, natural gas prices, utility bills are going up. So it's not just, one area it's it's stuff that all of us are experiences and if your wages aren't going up as much as it then you know it's a tax on you so we're not at that point yet i don't think but uh that that'll be the pressure to really slow that down and then what what, what will be the problem when when it does well we'll have to wait and see but let's just start with the like being able to do the taper <laughs> in November or at least announce it without, you know, without the market going crazy. Um, so like the fed's going to have to have some tolerance for volatility around that and tolerance for pain, right? You can't unwind this thing without expecting some, uh, and they're not even unwinding it. They're just slowing it down, (laughs) but there has to be some tolerance to say, like, I don't care what, if the market is going to sell off five, 10%, which is what we're seeing now. Uh, because of an expectation of I'm still going to do it because uh, inflation is the bigger is the bigger concern. So we're closer to that, but uh, you know we're not there just yet. But well, maybe maybe a maybe a bigger topic for next month. But I maybe think so. Time, maybe we'll we'll see a dip that we can uh, get in there. And yes. buy. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, Charlie. Well, I know we we went a little bit over here, but I, I, you know, thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, yeah, great stuff as usual. Um, you know, again plug your, your, your blog and then follow me on Twitter one more time. And if anybody wants to see these charts, uh, they are in Y charts um, under our fundamental charts. Uh, if you go to the uh, open menu, start from template and then look for the name of this webinar and identify these charts. But thanks for joining us, Charlie. Thanks to Great. everybody. Yeah. Thanks, to thanks everyone. Uh, for, and we'll see you next month. And anyone jumped on late or, uh, you know, you can, we, there'll be a replay available in the next day or two. So go to the Y charts, uh, YouTube channel, or I'll, I'll be sure to tweet it out or put it out on the blog, but thanks again, everyone. A lot of fun, Caleb. Thank you. All right. Bye everybody. Take care. <laughs>